Professor Gutzfiele is a world traveler. He's been to 93 countries and he travels, I've never seen anything like it. It, it comes with a being an entrepreneur, being out of the box. And hopefully he will say a few words about his next plan. He was just telling me, coming in, and I was like, wow. But Professor Gutzwiller is an entrepreneur. He is a professor also at uh, St. Gallen. One of the things I wanted to work was figure out somebody in St. Gallen we can discuss and collaborate. In my experience, though, it's very important to have practical experience of having been out there. So he has been out there, and we have talked and discussed and hopefully we'll make, put something together but he graciously ex agreed to come and talk to you about his experience as an entrepreneur with that very good thank you very much well you know Reza I do everything for ETH Zurich for a very simple reason my granddad studied here he was in geology my dad studied here he was in uh, he was a forest for engineer and uh, it's not only that I'm here in uh, this lecture today, I also lecture corporate development since about three years uh, for the for the MTech Institute. So always when I get to ETH, it gets, it gets warm around my heart. Because this is a place where, you know, my dad and my granddad got their formation. And uh, they were internationals. So, uh, uh, I grew up in Africa, in, in West Africa and Ghana. So uh, in my heart, I'm, a, I'm an African. And uh, uh, then the rest of my youth I spent in Italy. And I came back, I came to Switzerland actually only for two things. For military service, because I had to, and to go to university. And you know, uh, being international, uh, in, in, in my school, in the international school, I, I was together with 80 nations. Uh, so for me it was clear, you know, I had, uh, I had to escape, I had to go out of Switzerland after a certain time. But I married a lovely woman from uh, Bündnerland, uh, very local. Uh, so uh, since 30 years, I'm, I'm stuck in Switzerland. Uh, so they, this was the reason, perhaps, to bring a company international. So uh, I just want to give you a, a, a brief overview of, uh, of what I did. Uh, the startup that we started uh, almost uh, 20 years ago uh, was uh, starting from university, actually. And that's where we created the business. Now, it, it was not a product business. It was a services business. But uh, as Reza showed, whether you design products which are physical or service, which are, which, which are, not, which are not physical, uh, the same principle apply. And I, uh, and I want to not focus so much on the product or services creation part, but once you have proven that uh, your product sells or your services sells, uh, how do you ramp up a company so that you, that you get the fruits of, of, of what you did? So how did it start? It was in 1989. Uh, I finished my, uh, my, uh, my master's degree. My wife was pregnant with my first son uh, 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 on the way. And I had a job at the investment bank. Because you know the investment banks, they came, they came to university, they hide you directly from the bench. And I was there two weeks, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Because it was uh, very much about money, not so much about soul. So uh, I discussed with my wife, what should we do? We even, we even moved to Zurich, my wife being pregnant with a big belly, nice belly. And so uh, it was only because I had to look for a job short term that I decided uh, to do a PhD study at the University of St. Gallen because it paid okay. It didn't pay much, but it paid enough. So when I finished the PhD study, uh, there was again the problem now you have to apply for a job. And my doctoral father at that time, uh, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, having the chair of information management at the University of St. Gallen. Uh, the Senate told him that he should found an, an institute. Now, you have to understand that the University of St. Gallen Institute is like a business. Uh, they fund uh, one professor, two assistants, that's it. You have to go for the rest, you have to go for yourself. So it's like founding a small business. So my doctoral father told me whether I would uh, help him to build up the institute. And I said no, because I'm not, I wasn't interested in an in academic career, actually. 
but uh, we figured out that uh, we should try something. We will found this institute. We will set up a research program with industry. And within this research program, we will, we will uh, create knowledge, which we would, will apply in a consulting company, and then grow this company. At that time, I was 26 years old. It sounded OK. It sounded OK for me. So we started uh, with a new curriculum in uh, 1989 with graduate studies information and technology management at the University of St. Gallen. At that time, it was really new. Uh, we set up a research program in information management. Uh, and then we set up a company as a boutique uh, where, where we applied some of this uh, some of this knowledge that we created. We were working together, uh, after three years, we were working together with 35 large corporations uh, uh, in research projects. We built up 50 doctoral students within three years. So they really produced uh, know-how. And then we took it into the company and, uh, and uh, made it as consulting products. As you see here, we had uh, quite a, a moment from 1989 until 1995 where the company was a boutique, where the main focus was on creating the consulting products. So we were small, we applied what we, what we did in research here, and we, 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 we tried to figure out what it works. When we were sure that our products works, and, that, uh, and the product essentially was a, a unique consulting approach, uh, which has uh, a so-called process model, which you apply with your clients so that you're able to repeatedly deliver good quality in your consulting projects. So that was, that was the scope of uh, what we were looking for. And after about six, seven years, we were sure it works. And then we ramped the, we ramped the company up. So that was, a, that was the product creation phase or the services creation phase. And then when we were sure it works well, then we, 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 we grew the company. And then we went into the international expansion, which brought me out of St. Gallen because I was somehow stuck in St. Gallen or I was somehow stuck in, uh, in Switzerland. So, what is our business, or what is the business that we, that, we, that, we, that we invented? Very simple. Companies, especially international companies, they face dramatic environmental changes because of globalization. Today, producing companies, they have distributed supply chains all over the world. They source components in China, they assemble in Vietnam, they sell in the US, everything is flowing. So they have a huge complexity. On the other hand, there is information technology which allows you to model uh, global processes and to, uh, and to steer global processes by implementation of uh, information systems. So we said that that is our business and we want to figure out how do companies, how, how does a systematic transformation of a company work by applying new processes and new information systems and information technology to support these systems? So this is the business and which actually created the transformation business for consulting companies to go in, assist a larger corporation to transform, to adapt themselves uh, into global processes for the information age. So that was the business scope and our unique approach was in research to figure out a method and a methodology how can you drill down from strategy through business model through a process model through information systems in a very secure way that you're able to deliver such new architectures which are process and information system architecture so that those projects for our clients are no risk anymore you have to understand, for example, when Siemens transformed, they spent 3 billion euro on this project. So we're not talking about small projects. We're talking about really big, huge projects where corporations spend uh, a lot of money. And our vision was, we are the doctors. We're coming from university. We have figured out the way it works. It's like a, you know, it's like a heart surgery. If you have a heart surgery, you don't want people to uh, test on you. You want it to be delivered with no risk. So it's the same with transforming businesses. The chief executives, they don't want anyone, an artist, to come to fiddle around. They want serious consultants, which know the business, then to transform the company and so that the, the investment uh, bears fruits. So we were in the transformation business. 
That was the development of the group on one page. We started in 1988 uh, by incepting the company and we had a foundation and a boutique phase which was seven years. In these seven years essentially we had the research going on at the university where we, where we were uh, uh, doing research on transformation projects, we were doing research on how uh, the best way to implement strategies, how to link it to information systems. So seven years so, uh, seven years, the company at that time had, uh, had uh, 25 employees and the shareholders' equity at that time was 4 million Swiss francs. So the accumulated profits after tax was about 4 million Swiss francs. Uh, by coincidence, I've, I finished my habilitation thesis uh, in 1993, 1994. So uh, uh, I didn't want to do an academic career, so I said, okay, now I'm going to step, step over into the company. The company was at that time 25 people. You can still manage it with your left hand. So, so then we said, now I need, to, uh, I need to take both hands. And we had the first expansion phase, which uh, was about five years, uh, from 1995 to 2000, where, after, uh, where we were going after international clients. So our clients were Swiss, German, and Austrian companies, which conducted the global business, which were challenged, which had to transform themselves to be able to cope with global business and to be able to steer, uh, to steer global business. So we did a, we did a first uh, a ramp up phase from uh, 1995 to 2000 from 25 employees to 450 employees, which is uh, quite a lot. It, it takes about 100% growth or 120% growth per year. So that's hyper growth. Uh, when you go over 30% a year, you go into hyper growth and you have to manage hyper growth in another fashion as you would manage normal growth when it's 20%, 25%. In, 2000, uh, in, 2000 and, in 2001, we had a huge financial crisis. Uh, some of you might, might, might remember yourself. That was uh, when the dot-com bubble was bursting and all the financial markets were uh, falling down. The, the Swiss Performance Index, uh, which is now at, uh, at 6,500, he was at 9,000, he dropped, and everyone is sad today because uh, the stock market was falling so much. At, uh, in in uh, uh, April 2001, he was at 3,500. So we still have uh, a buffer to go downwards <laughs> if we're talking about the crisis. So we had a huge crisis. And what happened is that uh, our clients essentially they stopped buying consultants because they were all saving on projects, they were all saving money. So I could do, uh, what I could do was a, was a fantastic experience uh, facing, uh, having a face with extreme price pressure. Within 36 months, prices were dropping 30%. And no one had, uh, no one had work because uh, no one wanted, uh, wanted a uh, consulting project anymore. So that was for me a real, a real life MBA because our ambition was we are, we are a growth company. So we continued to grow. So we went from uh, 450 employees to 600 and we grew the shareholders equity from 13 million to 60 million in the time when it was the biggest crisis. So we, were, we didn't expand a lot anymore, but uh, we added something like, uh, li like another third uh, of the workforce. And then we, start, we had a second expansion phase, especially going to, uh, to Russia, uh, Ukraine, Slovakia, China, and, uh, and Romania. Uh, at the end, I sold the company uh, in uh, uh, April last year. In April 2007, we were 800 people. We had, uh, we had uh, 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 revenues, uh, uh, built service of uh, over 150 million Swiss francs. It was the largest Swiss consulting company and no one knew about it because we didn't care too much to be in the, in the newspapers, you know, just to say we're, we're great, we're great guys and we're the best. Uh, we, were just, we were just doing the business we were growing. So, this is the footprint how it looked uh, when we sold the company. So all over the world, uh, I was flying 350,000 miles a year, which is, uh, which is a lot. So it was, always, it was always going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but it was always about all the same zone. So not uh, other time zones, but, uh, but in, the same, in the same heat zone. Now, I told you before, a, a very critical point was uh, go slow during product creation. 
So now, we didn't do that at the desk. We did research at the university with about, uh, at that time, 50 doctoral students in so-called competence centers with 35 industry partners. So we set the governance system that they, that they told us which are the topics that we should take into research. Uh, we did the research there with about 50 doctoral students. What we did then, we distilled those results and we, de uh, we developed methods of the way that you do a secure kind of consulting. And then we went to clients and we applied it. And when we saw it worked, it delivers results. It's like now you, 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 you have the proven technique of how to do heart surgery and it works. Then we said, okay, now we go into the second phase and we'll do uh, industrial ramp up. So I will be talking about industrial ramp, ramp up now because that, that's, the, that's the, hyper part, the hyper growth part and that's the really fun part of the story because it really goes fast and you feel the wind blowing. Now also there we said, you know, you should, you should never do something as an artist. If you like arts, be artists. But with art, the outcome is never sure. Now, if you want to be professional, you figure things out when they work, until they work, and when they work, you do them professionally. So the same thing as we, uh, as we created our products, we did the same thing with the ramp up. When we saw it works, then we said, now we have to care for the professional ramp up uh, that we are able to manage hyper growth. And I want to, I want to show you on, on which level uh, we, uh, we were doing that. Now, essentially, it's about managing. It's about, it's about managing hyper growth. So if we talk about management, uh, the first thing is operational management. You have to manage day-to-day -day operations in a growing company. Then it's about strategic management because, uh, you know, if you, when you have your products or your consulting services, you can be sure your market will change. So your products, they're never forever good. They're good for one year, two year, but the market changes too. So you always have to adapt to the environment, to the envi uh, environmental change in the market, like our clients had to, uh, had to do, we ourselves too. And then, also very, uh, very uh, important point, it's about normative management. You know, companies are productive social systems. Productive means they create value. Social means they're human beings inside. And you have to care for the energy, uh, whether you have, uh, whether you have a, a, a good energy level within the company, which is sustainable over a long period of time, not just produce energy for one, two years, and then everyone is burned out. So you have to care, you have to care for energy level that you are able to, to, uh, to produce sustainable uh, high results. It's like a soccer team. You know, if you, if you want to have an outstanding soccer team, it's not enough to get the best technicians. You have to care for sense. Uh, you, have to, you have to bring the people together. The people, they, have, uh, they, have to, uh, they need to have esteem for each other. They need to feel like winners, and then they will do an uh, extra mile. So I want to talk about those, uh, about, about those three uh, management levels uh, in, in the ramp up phase. Let's start with uh, operational management. Now, in 1995, we were sure that our products are working. We, we were 25 people, uh, 25 consultants. We had very good clients. Uh, the consulting products were proven. Then we said, OK, now it's time to care about our internal processes. Because as we, as we ramp up, we need to manage our processes. So we decided <laughs> for a so-called process map, which, uh, which uh, those were those until we sold the company, we were managing the company uh, uh, along this process map. So we have to care for product and business development. We have to care for corporate development. That, that is our own change. As the company is getting bigger, we have to change the company as we go along. And then we have a lot of operational processes. The most important ones being uh, 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 public relations and marketing in a smart fashion. Now, you have to understand the culture that we had. We were coming from university. We were sitting on the best product too. And we were aware that we have to do something, but to be honest, we thought that the clients, they should line up at the door <laughs> to start working with us. So especially, uh, you know, as, we, as we, we, we started as a university team, this was a real culture change to, uh, 
to force to go out uh, to look for clients. So that's PR marketing. Then it's about selling. You know, as you grow fast, you have to know what is your position, what, what, what will you be selling in the next 6 to 12 to 18 months. You have to figure it out somehow because you are, you're putting resources to the company. So uh, you, you cannot make it an art or just put your finger in the wind and say, I think it's so much. You have to figure out ways to measure that. So that's about sales. And then delivery, as you are growing and as you are always on the edge of your capacity, you are not allowed to get your clients upset. So the quality that you deliver must be 100%. So you have to care for the way that you deliver. And then you need, you need uh, infrastructure which supports that, a human resource management which uh, pumps in human resources as you grow. You know, if you grow more than 100% uh, percent, uh, a year, you need uh, operations management so that you, that you get the figures that you need to drive the company. You need infrastructure management uh, because our consultants are out there, so they need handies, they need laptops, they need connectivity. This is something which has to be managed. And of course, we have to care for uh, know-how management because uh, as you are hyper-growing, you're, you're getting new people in the company. First, they have to understand the company. They have to understand the way that we work. They have to understand the culture uh, 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 as, as you're growing. So what I, what I want to do is to look a little bit in, in those pro, uh, processes to see. Uh, to, to show you. Let's start with PR and marketing. So the main challenge there was, you know, as we were a boutique, it was very easy for us to get clients because, uh, you know, we were very much connected to this research program with a pool of 35 uh, companies which did research for us. They hired us uh, into projects. Uh, so we had one or two opportunities and we did nice projects. As we were starting growing, so we had, the, the system has changed. No one was coming to us anymore. So we had to go to look for clients. This is very, very difficult. The first error that we did, we said we will hire a sales force. So we hired a sales force and our consultants, they were not talking to them. The, uh, the sales people, they came in and said, look, I have got a fantastic lead. Then the consultant said, oh, that's nice, but they were not interested because they still thought the clients should come or they, they, they told the salesman, bring the client here. I have no time for you now, bring the client here. So this was about three, four, five years of a mental change for everyone to understand that you are fed by the client. The money comes from the client, not from your good products. And you have to care for that. That's, that was really a big mental shift. So uh, uh, what, what we did is, you know, building up press relations, uh, especially in the in the, in the international markets, Germany, US, Japan. So uh, essentially, how did the, sale, the sales work? We, we essentially visited subsidiaries of international companies, of Swiss, German, and, uh, and Austrian companies abroad, and said, we are here to provide consulting services for you. At the same time, we talked with the headquarter, and then we had those large transformation projects to support. So that was, it was, it was, uh, a, a very strong awareness shift that we had to do in the heads and to, uh, you know, uh, if you're in professional services, you cannot place ads in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung to say, we're the best company. No one believes you anyway. So you have to build personal relationships one-to-one -one, and you have to go into, let's say, the very serious press and there you have to appear on, uh, not with ads, but with articles which are written about your company. So th that's the way that you, you, you build trust and you build credibility. Uh, sales. Uh, this was also a very, uh, very tough thing. Uh, uh, introduction of a systematic sales process, which, uh, which really, uh, which really uh, uh, started with identifying target clients. You know, inviting target clients to, uh, to gatherings, to conferences, caring for those clients, uh, identifying opportunities. Once you saw there is an opportunity within the client, then you had to, you had to cover the buying center. So that means you have to cover the client. In a, in a corporation, it's never one person buying a product or a service. You have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten decision makers. So you have to go to all of them. And you have to cut that. This is covering the buying center. You, you might have the best product or the best service. Doesn't matter. There are there are multiple decision makers in a in a in a in a buying process. So you have to cover them. Then uh, uh, 
project proposals than uh, in, uh, uh, going for the pro uh, project decision and, and signing the contract. So if you want to grow very fast, you need a very systematic sales process because you, you, uh, uh, you have potential contract sizes and potential uh, probabilities. So if you have a very systematic sales process uh, with a certain point of time, you are sure whether your so-called sales pipeline, this is all the sales that you have in the next 6, 12 or, so, or 18 months is growing or shrinking. Now, if you see that your sales pipeline is growing, you have to add, re you have to add resources. If you see that your sales pipeline stays flat and you still add resources, you know what happens? Your profits go like this. And it's, this is very fast because, uh, you know, in services business, uh, the costs that you have are labor costs and the rest is a little bit marketing and then the rest is profits. So uh, it's, uh, you, you, need to, you need to have this in balance. So that's why sales pipeline management is very difficult, uh, is very important. And most of our managers, they said this is nonsense because we're working with unsharp data. So we, we, we are not willing to do this uh, statistics and computations and we had to make them understand that with unsharp data, if you always use the same principle, it gets very sharp because it shows your directions, whether is it going upwards, is it stable or is it going downwards? And that's very important if you want to grow fast because otherwise you run into problems. Most fast growing companies, they hit the wall. So boom, and if you hit the wall and then uh, uh, y uh, your profits go down, your shareholder equity goes down, you don't have air to breathe. Your, your money is away and you go, well, you don't go bankrupt, but you get bought. No, and someone else but, uh, with, deep, with deeper pocket buys you and essentially as, a, as an entrepreneur you have done the job, uh, you were just driving too fast and uh, in a curve you couldn't hit the brakes early enough, so it, it, it just threw you out and someone else would take your company and will say, here, one dollar, thank you very much, that, that's the door. And you know, that's not professional, first of all, uh, that's not responsible neither, so that's why you have to do something like that. So. Being very stringent on the sales processes so that you're able to measure where you are and even to uh, put pressure on sales process uh, uh, that, uh, that more needs to be done. The third one is delivery. Now, you are delivering projects. It's the same when, when you produce, that's your, that's your, that's your uh, uh, production, your production facilities. You need to be sure that your production facilities, they produce the right quality. So what we did, is we developed methods of the way that, that projects are de delivered and we train them to each, uh, to each uh, IMG employee. Very intensively, very intensively, we even established uh, own uh, language. You know, uh, we said, you know, we, as a consultant, we need to talk like engineers. You know, if you, have, if you have civil engineers and civil engineers talk together, they have the same language of civil engineering. So we said, what we need is a language of business engineering. Well, you couldn't buy it, at, you cannot buy it at a university, you cannot buy it in the bookstore. We said, we will establish this language of business engineering so that when people gather on projects, they talk the same language. And uh, this makes you very productive first, but second, combined with a clear project process, it makes you very safe towards the client that you're able to deliver. So, that was really where we invested in, in, in our research with the university. So at the end, it looks very simple. It looks really simple. So you manage, you manage a sales process. First of all, that's generating clients, then converting those clients into projects, and then delivering. So uh, uh, the sales and the delivery process, uh, you can subdivide, and this is, it's a, it's a machine. It's a machine. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like a, a, a plant where you have your, 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 your plant stations, uh, you know, in, you said Mercedes-Benz, when the, when the cars get assembled. It's about this. This is the way that you design businesses today. Now, of course, you have uh, people and souls inside. Now, if they are, if they, if they see, you know, this is a growing company, we're successful, you grow 100% per year, you add profits, oh, they like it. They like it. But you have to make sure that the people are aligned to this. So uh, if, you, if you have people who are not aligned to this, you have to explain them lovingly, it's not the right place for you here. 
because we are running this machine at uh, 7,500 rounds per minute. So it's not now that we want to fiddle around in the engine. So this engine has to run now. So uh, uh, you really have to get a good alignment with, uh, with, with the employees. Then uh, on the, the supporting processes, uh, we built up uh, in the years global one data center with 70 servers and all the internal processes, everything was running in St. Gallen. So whether it was in Shanghai or it was in Osaka or it was in Atlanta, or it was in San Francisco, everything was hooked to St. Gallen uh, at almost no cost because we used uh, ASDL technology, which is cost you nothing, with a virtual private network. So it was a very, very cheap way, but it was a very efficient way. So we had all the data we needed to steer the company, we had it in St. Gallen. So, for, for example, myself, every day I could check how many employees do I have, uh, on, uh, 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 in which profit centers are they, uh, which are the ranks. Uh, you could drill down to each employee. Each employee was their own cost center, so we, could, we, uh, we had the revenues and the costs to the employees. You could, you could, you could figure out whether your clients were profitable. Uh, everything was at hand, real time, instantly. Uh, that's the sales, the sales funnel. So uh, every month uh, we calculate out of the sales cycle the, the sales funnel and so you could, you could, uh, you could always uh, check whether you have enough sales in front of you to, uh, to add the resources. So how, what, what did we do? We had a recruiting machine and we recruited, no, we were talking to a lot, many, many, many people. But we left them in a cycle of about six months. So we were not telling them, oh, join us tomorrow. So we just left them in a cycle. And then we saw how is business going, business going up. Then we said, please come. The business going down, we let, we let them in the cycle. Business going up, come. So every, everything, and we, and we knew until we, we gave a contract to someone until he was here. It took six months for him to come. And then it took three months to train him. So it was nine months. So we all had to see where, how are we flying in nine months. And this worked perfect. Was really, was really perfect. So now if you manage that, you can drive very fast and you know you're taking every curve. If you don't manage that properly, you get thrown out of the curve. So uh, this is the sales pipeline. The same thing what we did is uh, on the delivery side, we were not only checking the sales that we were doing, we were, only, uh, we were asking each month, we were asking each consultant give us your assignments that you think you'll be working on for the next months. So uh, we, 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 we had a technique of so-called delivery patterns where we could measure whether a business unit, each month we could measure uh, uh, how a unit was performing. Uh, perhaps one month they were saying this is the pattern for the next three months and then they, it, it went down here. And then we knew there was a problem. And then we could, go in, we could go in and figure out what it was, whereas this unit, for example, had, uh, was constantly managing quite well. So, so although there you could uh, even cross-check not only what you were selling, you could cross-check uh, by, by accumulating the, the project assignments of all consultants whether this was consistent. What are you selling and what do they think are they delivering as a, as a second security measure. Then each month, uh, 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 very stringent management accounting. So uh, on each resource there was management accounting on clients, on projects, so that we, that we could steer that. Uh, monitoring of utilization of resources. So the red one was not good, so the managers knew here they have to do something about that. And that's the way that you, you, you drive a car fast. It's like, you know, when you speed, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Porsche 911 driver, so you have, uh, you have, uh, you, ha you, you see how fast you go, you have the temperature of the engine, you have, very important for engineers, you have the oil pressure. So you, you always need to have a high oil pressure. If you go 7,000, 8,000 uh, rounds per minute, uh, you have, uh, you see how many rounds per minute you go, you have a cockpit. So when you, when you do hypergrowth, you really need a cockpit and you have to read this cockpit because you're driving at a very fast, uh, at a very fast pace. Now for strategic management, of course ourselves, we always had to change our business too. 
So uh, this was the, the corporate development process and then the product and business development process. Uh, uh, each year we figured out how are we going to develop the company itself now into the next, into the next phase as our, com uh, as our clients are changing too. So that was our strategy on, uh, on, on one page. I don't want to go uh, too much into detail with that. But to, 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 to say in short, the position that we, that we achieved is that with mid-sized companies uh, in, uh, in the German-speaking speaking part of Europe, we established ourselves as the trusted advisor for their corporate transformation. So we were, we were working with uh, companies like Fonac, or, with, or like Synthes, like Wirt, like, uh, like, uh, like Tekan, for example. Not the, not the very big ones, but the medium-sized ones. For a very simple reason, the very big companies like the Novartis or the Roche, what they do, they source consultants for specific tasks and they try to manage the overall transformation projects. Whereas the mid-sized companies, you have a real partnership with the CEOs of those companies and then you conduct those projects in a partnership, which is much better because you have less, you have less price pressure. So it's, it's better to, uh, to, to, for profit generation. And then what we did every year, unfortunately I cannot show what it is because uh, we sold the project, uh, we sold the company to a public listed company and I, I cannot display what uh, the strategic plans are uh, going, going forward. Every year we set up uh, an internal transformation program where we said what are our own projects that we need to conduct to adapt the company in this growth path and uh, to adapt it to new environmental circumstances. So also there uh, to be very disciplined in adapting the company. Now normative management, I think that's uh, especially for engineers, this is the most underestimated uh, aspect. Now you have to understand that this is something which I, which I learned as, uh, because I know I was starting this company from, uh, from, uh, from the beginning. And uh, this is the way that you manage. You know, essentially, psychologically, uh, a human being has two forces or two drivers. One is fear and one is love. One is fear and one is love. Uh, one thing associates to the left brain, which is, you know, your left brain is a, is, a, is a linear processor and the right brain is a parallel processor. The right brain is belly feeling, is feeling, is emotions. Now, if you, want to, uh, if you want to create something extraordinary, it's only by love. It's only by love that people, that people follow. So uh, it's, it's also a, a question of how you look at things. Uh, and there are many companies which, uh, which, uh, which operate on pressure. And pre pressure, is, uh, pressure is fear which operate on, uh, on people having energy for uh, avoiding failures. So this, this might work very well for a certain moment, but uh, to be long-term successful, it's really, you have to care for sense in organization. You have to care for relationships between the people. You have to care for uh, esteem between the people so that you can really form a big, a big team. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have achieved this, you have sense and you have energy in organization and you have sustainable, long-lasting energy in the organization. So how did we do that? Uh, uh, you do that with, uh, with uh, really being serious about what your values are. You know, uh, not, not just talking about values, but really enforcing values in the company. This is our value matrix in, in translated to Polish. I don't know where there are some Polish colleagues here. Ah, okay, that was uh, we had we had 150 people in Poland. In in where are you from in Poland? Warsaw. From Warsaw. Okay, we had uh, the, we had the most operations in Wrocław and then uh, something in something in Warsaw. So those values said first of uh, said, uh, uh, you know culture it's something about values and behavior, m uh, the way that you behave. So so we defined. First of all, a value hierarchy that first is the client. So we die for the client. So we don't cheat clients. We don't, uh, we don't uh, take too much money out of clients. We just die for satisfied clients first. Then it's the company in second priority. We want to be a growing company. 
and then third, it's the employee. So whenever there was a conflict, for example, in 2001, 2002, when the prices dropped 30%, you know what I did? I stood, in sub, I stood in front of the crew and said, guys and girls, I think next month it will be 20% less salary. And it was not a problem because those were the values. Company before employee. And when we hired people, we made this clear. And if someone said, no, 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 me, it's me before company, then we said, mm, perhaps it's, you're in the wrong place. So always make sure when you take people on board that they fully understand values and behavior. Uh, on the other hand, what we, uh, our promise was, uh, when the economy went bad, we're not firing anyone for economical reasons. For performance reasons, yes, but not for economical reasons. And we even managed in those bad times to, uh, to still grow from 450 to, uh, to 600 employees and to be extremely profitable in that, in that time to add uh, many profits. So uh, you have to be very clear. Now, you have to understand that, you know, companies are productive social systems. So when, when people feel well and they see you have, a, you, people are seeking for order. For order in your strategy, you know, the way you sell, the way you do your projects, the direction is clear where, where the company is heading, and they are seeking for order, for social order. And when you have, I, I call this psychological, social psycholo psychological order, and that one is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, mechanical strategic order, you, you, which, you, which you, can, uh, you can assemble this like a machine. The other one is about human beings, and that's why it's love. So at the, at, in the beginning, you have to make sure that for everyone it's clear in what kind of company is he entering, that he has a really full understanding, and then you can play the game as it is stipulated. So uh, this was very important, and then also the, uh, the behavior, the way that we behave, the way that we act. Now you have to understand, a company, especially a growing company, is like a family. The people which come, you know, in the second, third, the fourth wave, they will look how do the people which, which, which are already in the company, or how do the bosses behave, and they will inherit their behavior. So that's the, that, this is the way that you form a culture. So even with that, you can almost engineer a culture. Now, how did we do that? My job, essentially, was teaching. I was traveling all over the world, and I was teaching. I was, I was because this was the most important uh, task for new employees which joined the company to understand this company is selling and delivering this way and no other way. And this is the culture of the company. This is the way that we behave and this is the way that I act. So what, what I did essentially, I, I, I did teaching. And the other thing which I did, whenever we had new managers coming in, I took them to clients. So they were seeing how I was dealing with my biggest clients. And they could, so what did they do next time? They imitated me. Or then I sent them with other managers and they started imitating this behavior. So a lot of, a lot of teaching, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of parting, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, I was running something like, uh, like 10 to 12 uh, 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 teaching classes uh, uh, each year with, with 50 people. So I, had a, uh, I could see many, many people all over the world. And then, of course, uh, well, hard work, hard workouts. And uh, this is where I, where I found my passion you know, for traveling. Uh, whenever, whenever I am at some place, some place in the world, I do something for my uh, adrenaline. That was in, uh, in, uh, in Clearwater Beach uh, in Florida. It was in, in February. The water was 11 degree cold. So I, I was really freezing on the jet ski. <laughs> Uh, to get to get some uh, to get some adrenaline, so in, in short, to wrap up, f uh, the product creation phase is one thing. Okay, then you have you, ha you have proven it; it works in the market, and people buy it. This is no guarantee for a money printing machine. The real work starts afterwards. Then you go to processes. And then you go to culture. And you have to do this in the same, in the same disciplined way. And then re you, really, you really can go into a ramp up. 
And now if you take a, if you take a, a entrepreneurial way, you must know, you know, at the end it's about creating value. At the end it's about creating value. You have to know for yourself when is the best time that you leave, you leave it to someone else. Because, uh, you know, the world changes. So everyone has to make a decision. It's, it's no scandal if, uh, the, uh, if the founders, they go off the boat. So we took the decision uh, when we said, uh, no, we have brought the company. We have done the most difficult uh, task. The company is well established with very large accounts. It's running. It will go to 2,000 employees. And we said, now it's a good moment that we will, that we will sell. Uh, for me, this was a very good uh, occasion because, uh, you know, as a professor, is a hard job, but it's not a too hard job. It's a it's an okay job, you know. It's an okay job. It's very very re rewarding if you're able to lecture. So uh, I do that. So what I do today, I'm I'm 50%. I'm at the University of St. Gallen, and uh, uh, I, I'm I'm executive education professor. So normally I don't I don't have so young people as you are. Normally my my clientele is uh, 45 and above which is also very rewarding, uh, but I have 50% of my time which is spare. So what I do, the rest, uh, I, I coach a lot of companies in, in, with their growth. Uh, I mean, I'm in some boards of companies which are very fast growing and it's fascinating of to, to go with those companies. And the rest of the time, that's what Reza said uh, before, I, I have a life project. You know, I look with loving eyes on this world. I, you know, perhaps this is because I grew up in Africa. You know, Africans, they, 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 they're always happy, they always laugh. And uh, my personal project, my personal life project is that I, I want to be together with the people in every country of this world. So I've done 93 until now, uh, and uh, uh, I, still have, uh, I still have 99 to go. And I'm 47 now, so... Uh, I have, uh, I still have, you know, I have on my list, I have a lot, uh, still a lot to do. So uh, uh, my next trip, just to make you jealous, uh, uh, in, you know, by end of February, when your exams are over, you, you, you prepare for class again, I will be taking my, uh, my Toyota Land Cruiser heavy duty expedition mobile. Then I will go to, uh, to uh, I will go to uh, Turkey. Then I will go to, to uh, uh, Georgia then uh, Azerbaijan, and uh, then I will go to Armenia, and then I will go across whole Iran, and then I will, I will, uh, I will, I will go to Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and then Kazakhstan. Uh, actually, I want to go to Pakistan and Afghanistan, but it's, you know, it's too, un it's too unhealthy. And then I will take from Almaty, Kazakhstan, I will take four to 5,000 kil kilometers through the desert until I get to the Ural. Then I'll take Russia and Belarus, Poland, and then, oh, but you know, from Belarus home, it's, uh, it's only two days. It's, uh, <laughs> this is, it's, it's, a, it's a small trip. So it will, uh, I will have a, a, something like a additional 12 countries on my list. And uh, that's what I do every year. That's, this is, a real privilege, you know, uh, uh, if you have had your exit as an entrepreneur, uh, you can have a hobby like this. Now, th this hobby, it's not, a question of, uh, it's not a question of expenses. Having an expedition mobile is not so expensive. You know, the real privilege is having time. The real privilege is having time. Uh, because, you know, if you, uh, uh, in, in your later life when you are uh, you're managing something or you're, uh, you're on projects, you will be always be short on time and I'm, I'm very grateful that I can have this time. So, thank you very much. I, can, I, I, I don't know how's, how's it, yeah, I, I, managed to, no, to, I managed to be in time. Can I take some questions Absolutely. or? Absolutely. Well, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. We have yes, please. Are you making this trip alone or with you? No, I, I always, uh, uh, not with my wife because you know it's, it's, it's 5.30 to 23.30. It's uh, very long days, 18 hours days. No, no, I do it with a co-pilot. I, I, I always look, I always look for co-pilot. So uh, if, we, if one of you would like to do something like that, just drop me a mail and perhaps in, <laughs> perhaps in 2011. I, I do it with people I, I, I barely know. So it's, uh, it's people I have a relationship but not very special and then you're one month together. And it's really, it's, it's fantastic. And then, of course, you have friends, you know, which is very valuable. 
with a question here? We have a more technical question. Yes. Um, what kind of contracts did you apply? What, was this purely time and material? Or no. Did you have, uh, uh, result responsibility? Uh, very different. Very different. If if you uh, if you uh, if you had uh, if you uh, we, we had fixed fixed price contracts. We have time material contracts. Uh, but you have to differentiate. If you have a fixed price contract, you are selling a product and not a project. So we had to make the clients understand that even a fixed price project, we have to stage it. Because a project is a design process. So they, 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 they understood it. So for both parties, it was OK. Did you ever lose money? Oh, yes, a lot. Oh, yes, a lot. Oh, oh a lot, a lot. You know, to establish the international operations, the, uh, well, on the, on the group level, we had, we had one value, which has, which said we are never using capital. We are only accumulating capital. OK? So, but the investments into the foreign subsidiaries, you know, to go to, to, go to China, Japan, uh, Philippines, it cost us 25 million Swiss francs. But, they, but we, we had enough profit. So the profit production was higher than what we lost in the foreign subsidiaries to build them up. So uh, this is this is uh, this is this is steering of corporate development. So you have to figure out, you know, how to do it, how to do it. And and for me, it was clear uh, there was only th there was only one direction uh, in shareholders' equity. It's upwards because the values were client, company, employee. So uh, 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 at the other at the other part, for an for an employee, it was very attractive because uh, perhaps one year wasn't so good. Next year was excellent again for him, and he had, you know, if you grow very fast, you have excellent career opportunities. So yes, we were losing money, and we know we had clients and contracts. We were, we were, they grilled us, they grilled us. So, uh, so life is very hard. Yes, uh, you know, it, uh, it, perhaps it looks easy. Uh, we were sweating. It was 80 hours a week. It was 350 miles uh, in aeroplanes uh, uh, by. Uh, which you took. I was just telling Reza, you know, uh, I was always lecturing at the University of St. Gallen, so typically I was, in, I, was, I was flying to Tokyo on Sundays. I arrived there Monday morning, uh, uh, Monday morning, 7 o'clock Japanese time, midnight, midnight Swiss time. You did two days of business. You, you went drinking with the Japanese because they, you know, they, they need socializing. You went karaoke. Uh, then you, 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 you couldn't have your flight back, so what did, what did you do in the evening? You went to Bangkok. And then in Bangkok, you switched the plane, which brought you to Zurich. 6.15, you arrived in Zurich. You went to the shower. You showered. You went in the car. 8.15, lecturing. So you know, if you do that back and forth, back and forth, it's, uh, you, you get very fast. You, you, don't even, you don't even feel yourself anymore. So sometimes it's very important to have a partner and a wife which says, come on, Thomas, no, just calm a little bit down. So it was, it was, uh, it was a big piece of work. But it was a lot of fun. Yes, Robert? Question about them. Um, if, if we, just, we just have a company without the, those, this background and the research background with those 50 PhD students, let's say you come up with the idea of uh, doing consulting, but basically you don't have time and opportunity to, to establish a new institute on the university. Would you dare to, to open such a, such a business and uh, do the research on demand of the clients? And well, you know, that's what, what Grace has said in strategy. Uh, you know, uh, in competitive strategy, you have to make a choice strategically. Either you're very cheap, so you go for a cost leadership strategy, and then they, they will buy you because you, you're able to decrease prices, or you have a differentiation strategy. So you need to know where do you differentiate. If you don't differentiate, it's difficult. So perhaps, you know, if you don't differentiate, you can be there, but you're not able to grow fast because you're not differentiating. So you, you need to know where do you make the difference. The difference that we made was that we said, it's a very secure transformation process, which is very sound, and we apply this to mid-sized international clients. So, uh, because they like to work with, and it worked out. It worked out. So, uh, uh, never start a business not knowing where you differentiate. And also one, one principle, uh, you know, uh, praying and hoping for that your venture goes well, it's useless. Pray and hope for intelligence and energy in yourself. And then, then, then it's OK. So then, that, that, you find, that, you, that you find your focus. And I think it's very important. You know, 
If you look at successful ventures, you will see they were always focused. They were always focused. So strategy is very much about things you, are, you decided not to do. Especially, you know, what I said when, when people were joining, I had so many intelligent people, you know, PhDs from university here and here and here, but we had to tell them, look, you are entering IMG and this is the way that we are doing those things. We are not interested in your ideas. We are interested, because you are not in research and development here, we are interested that you are satisfying clients with this machine that we build. Now, do you like it? Some said, fantastic. Others said, oh, no, 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 I want to blah, blah, blah. We said, no, no, that's, it's the wrong place. Please go, to, please go to someone else. So you have to make a selection in the very beginning so that you, that you, can, that you are able to maintain the order. Okay? And very often people do compromises and then it gets bad. Uh, just to reinforce that, when I finished my PhD, I went to industry and I had the talk. The talk is normally a senior manager sits you down and says, you're no longer in the university. This is how we do things here. Yep. For you to be successful, you have to fit into how we do things yep. here. This is no longer the... So it was a shock to me. What do you mean? You know, I'm really clever. I can do stuff. It doesn't <laughs> matter. This yeah. is where you will fit, if that's where you want to fit. And, and this is... Everybody gets that... Well, not everyone. Many lucky people get to, get to talk because you find out later anyway. Yes. In good companies, they'll let you know up front. Yeah. Although to let you know up front what the culture, the, what values are, you know, it's much easier. And then also, so it's very important when you see that people don't fit anymore, is how do you treat people that you are firing? You know, you can treat people very well on a personal level that you're firing. I, I fired something like 10 board members in my career. They're all my friends. No, so you, you know, the one is the personal relationship, and the other one is the performance relationship and the values. You know, for, for some people, as our company was growing, they were saying, we don't like this company anymore. It's, it's not what it was. Then I told them, this is true. Now, you should think about liking it, because if you don't like it, it's not good for you. You know, the company is progressing. The company is progressing anyway. Now, it's about you, and it's about your attitude. Now, think about changing that. It's a chance for you. Instead of uh, sticking to say, oh, you know, the old days were well, the company has changed. You know, today the world changes so fast. Every year is, diff is different, uh, is different uh, than the other. So it's really, it's really about culture and also the attitude of the people, you know, uh, loving the company, loving the values. And if they don't, you have, to, you have to work them out in a very decent way, in a very decent Fair way. way. You know, yeah, in a, very, in a very decent and fair, even I would say in a loving way, but you have to make clear, then it's, it's not good for your energy. So let's, let's look for an opportunity, perhaps in nine months, perhaps in one year, we have a solution. But please, because we have a responsibility for employees, we want you to give your best. So if you are not able to give it here, you're probably at the wrong place. So you, you, can't, you can't do that without threatening. Yes, you please? two last questions, one over there and one over here. I have more question about the ending of the company. About? The ending when you solved it. Yes. But looking back, you more or less picked the right moment you can pick. No, not. No, no, we didn't. Nowadays or today might be a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Was it just what I, made you sell I, it? I, I, I said, I said uh, my personal preference would have been to sell it a little bit later. But uh, with my other owners, uh, uh, and uh, we had Goldman Sachs as an investor. This, they, they choose it was the right moment. So all of that, you do very professional. So how did we do that? We, we did a research on all potential targets which might buy us. Then we had a short list. Then we, I entered into relationships with them to see whether we could, could cooperate. So uh, uh, we had a personal relation. And then two months before Christmas, we made a full-fledged trade sale. So we had, uh, we know we had a book about everything in the company and said, the company is for sale. You can read everything. Uh, you, you, you can conduct a due diligence. We had with Mary Lynch, we had an electronic data room uh, where they could uh, work. So we said, you know, over Christmas, uh, you can work, but we want a quotation. And, uh, you know, because then you're selling. So you have to be professional too. Now, for some people, it sounds brutal. But, you know, if you are selling, you try to get the best price for the shareholders.
That's why you're selling. That's the only reason. And uh, of course, then you, you have to also know when you sell the company that, uh, you know, I was chairman and, and CEO that you're not managing it anymore. So for me, it was clear I have to go out because I, I'm part of the old culture and the new owner has another culture. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to stand in the way for him to import his new culture because he bought the asset. So that, that was the time when I, when, when I had my exit. Uh, and then uh, I stayed for another uh, half, three quarters of a year. I stayed on the board, and then and then uh, I had my I had my departure, and then I was free, so I can travel. Last question. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. I have a question on the product itself. Um, yes. Can you give us any? I mean, I don't know if this is confidential or not, but can you give us any detail on what the product looks like? And it's uh, the product is a process. Sure, I mean this process. It's a process that uh, we applied in transformation programs within uh, for, for global clients. So it's like I, I say, you know, I say it's, it's like it's like a, it's like a heart bypass surgery. You know, when you do a, a heart bypass surgery. Well, metaphor, but in, yeah. in the practice, I mean, what what is it that? It's it's process. It's process. It's it, it's a it's a well well well. Now, now, scientifically speaking, it's a semantics. It's a semantic model, how business engineers talk. Then it's a, it's a process model. So the way that we proceed, it's a documentation model. What are the design objects that we have in the course of the project that we have to identify? You know, it's, it's very much uh, engineering type work is very much about <coughs> identifying structures. So what are the objects that we have to identify? And then uh, uh, the question is how do we document those objects and how do we interlink those objects for consistency, that's for multidimensional consistency. So, so you're trying to restructure the process of this company? Yes, well, it, it's not only. You take the strategy, you, 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 you design the business model, the way the company operates, then you go on process level, and then you go on information system level, because for a global company, if you have processes and no information system, you've got nothing, you know, because you, know, you, have, you have assembly in Vietnam, production in China, distribution in the US, so you need uh, information infrastructure which supports the processes. And where did you get this, this know-how in the first place? I mean, how did you With the 50 doctoral students in, the first, uh, uh, in, the, in the re this research uh, phase. I was essentially orchestrating this research program. But you were just out of a PhD as well? No? Yes, yes, yes. I was 26 and I had uh, a, small, a small son and a small daughter. And, and, but I had this, we had this vision. You know, the, the reason for me staying at the university doing that was to build up a company. But, uh, but uh, we knew, you know, it's not just, you know, it's incorporating a company is nothing. You need a product. Okay, so uh, uh, you, you have to do something. So that was, that was five to seven years hard work, yes. That was five to seven years hard work. You know, for the government in St. Gallen, it was fantastic. We were a big taxpayer. You know, it's, uh, very often people say, ah, is this intellectual property of the university or blah, blah, blah. They didn't care because we were, we were, we were finishing it and we were applying it and we were paying taxes. So it was uh, uh, for every, you know, building 800 jobs, that's for, for uh, this is the most fantastic thing that you can do, essentially. Great. With that, I want to thank Thomas for his thank you. very interesting. Thank you.